I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, we have talked about doing a series on on Confucius, and we just haven't gotten around to it yet. Today, we're kind of making up for that. We're, we're going to Minches, who is, I would say, probably more important to Confucianism than Con- Confucius himself. Uh, I know that's a, I would agree. a contentious claim, because how could how, how could Confucianism owe more to someone other than Confucius? But I, I mean, I think you can make the same argument, Rob, correct me if I'm wrong, in terms of uh, thinking, uh, Paul is probably more important to Christianity than, than, than Jesus himself. Yeah, applying the thought, I mean, and you could make the same, possibly in the same case about Martin Luther or John Calvin, any of the great people who are interpreting and applying an original text, if it's especially important, Mench has had a lot bigger impact in terms of how Confucius is actually applied than Confucius did. And Confucius is just so enigmatic. He's just such a hard to read. I mean, these are kind of, and I'm not trying to be glib here, but this is just kind of fortune cookies that have been in just short passages. You can't read Confucius without already knowing how to read Confucius. Mencius, on the other hand, you can read him and just understand him without any kind of exegetical baggage. Right. You know, he, you don't you don't need someone to interpret Mencius for you. Yeah, and it, it's it, the text itself is it, at least the way it's presented is a is someone basically explaining usually to people in power to rulers how to live a life based on Confucius's teachings. One of the reasons that Munches continues to exert an influence, I would argue, is that it is geared towards, okay, seriously though, how do you apply this stuff? You know, in Michael Nyland's book, uh, The Five Quote-Unquote Confucian Classics, which is a fascinating book, one of the things she points out is that when Confucian scholars, or what they were then known as just classical scholars, or just sort of scholars, when they made their, their appearance on the scene, they were weirdos. This, it wasn't like Confucius just showed up and all of a sudden the world went, wow, this is awesome. It was quite a while before people in power saw a way to apply Confucius' teachings to the actual administration of society. And Mencius is sort of that answer. Like, oh, you want to apply this stuff on a sort of a national level? All right, here's how you do it. Mencius is the guy who kind of gets the theory down and who explains how the rubber meets the road. But Confucius does not become big in government until the reign of Hanwu Di, which is from, I think, 141 BCE to, to something like 87 BCE. So, so even then, you know, we're talking about centuries before Confucius says his thing, Mencius interprets his master, and then it's still a couple of centuries later until we actually see this really applied. Two, you mentioned that these weren't really Confucians. They're actually called scholars. So the the Chinese term is Ru, and I think Michael Nyland has actually written some important work on on Ru. So you'll notice Ru sounds nothing like Confucian, because it's not, because the Ru existed before Confucius, and they weren't necessarily immediately connected. So in Chinese, there's not really any word for quote-unquote Confucianism, right, Rob? There's just like a uh, you know the word that 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 we today translate as Confucianism into English was actually Ruja. So it's like the the philosophy of the Ru or the the school of the Ru. And the Rus were kind of a particular kind of scholar. When we say Confucianism in English, that's probably a misleading way to translate this word. The Ru existed before Confucius. Uh, they weren't that closely associated with him. Eventually, they do come to be understood as this group of scholars who are very, very closely connected with Confucius and the teachings of Confucius. But initially, Confucius was just one amongst many Ru. Yeah, just a quick clarification, though, uh, Lee, when you when you mentioned there's not a word for Confucianism in Chinese, there are ways to talk about Confucianism in modern Chinese. They have terms, they have developed terms for it now. But you're right in the sense that for most of Chinese history, you didn't, a Confucianist, no one said Kong Zi Zhu Yi or Kong Jiao, something like that. You would say Ru Jiao, something like that, yeah. Those terms in modern Chinese were translated from Western languages. So so Confucianism is translated from English into back into Chinese, right? Right, which is an interesting thing. We'll, <laughs> we'll have to talk about that a little more when we do our, if I do our series on Confucius. 
And it's, you know, it's funny because it's not really that dissimilar. We always talk about analogs on this show, but I really do think it helps sometimes if you haven't read the material to have something kind of familiar to work with. But, you know, Christians weren't called Christians for quite a while. Good point. They were, they considered themselves Jews for a good part of the, of the early church. And the term didn't come in until much later. So, I mean, it's not quite the same because they didn't go millennia calling themselves Jews. Now, let's get back to the passage because we haven't even really read it or talked about it yet. I, I have to say, I find Mencius a lot more interesting to read than Confucius. Uh, like you say, you can't, Confucius does. You can't read Confucius. Like, it's not Confucius like Confucius really does up. feel like fortune cookies. I'm sorry to say. Just, yeesh. anyway. But Mencius does really seem to, I don't, I don't know any other way to say this, have something to say. Um <laughs> The passage that we're talking about is one of many where one of his disciples, one of his people is asking him about kind of one of his rivals, one of Munch's rivals. And in the story, in the, in the, it's a very brief one, but I'm still not going to read the whole thing because it's just long enough to be a little wearing if I read the whole thing. Munch's rival, Galdza or Galdzu, depending on the, the sort of script you're reading, has said that man's nature is neither good nor evil. And so one of his disciples is asking Mencius about it. And Mencius's point is basic. I, in fact, I'll read a couple of sentences because I really do think that the way it's translated by Wings at Chan is, is pretty clear here. Mencius said, if you let people follow their feelings or original nature, they will be able to do good. This is what is meant by saying that human nature is good. If man does evil, it is not the fault of his natural endowment. The feeling of commiseration is found in all men. The feeling of shame and dislike is found in all men. The feeling of respect and reverence is found in all men. And the feeling of right and wrong is found in all men. And I could go on there, but the idea is both very simple and very challenging, which is just this, that people on their own have all the programming necessary to be good people, right? They're not born animals that you have to beat into goodness. That's not how it works. And they all have it in common. There's not just a one group of people that has this. Everybody has this. And in the context of a lot of passages where Munches is advising leaders, you can see the challenge, which is you're presented with people who are perfectly capable of being the best people you can think of. If they're starting to suck, that should make you question what exactly it is you're doing about it, what it how you're making them that way. And this is kind of a radical thing to to teach, at least even now politically, if you're going to say, look, everyone's great. Everyone's born able to do everything they need to do. If there's all kinds of crime, it's because something happened along the way to make them change, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Rob, this kind of becomes the debate in Chinese philosophy and, and particularly Confucianism. Uh, are people innately good or innately bad? Mincha says innately good. Another line of Confucianism goes the other direction. That's, of course, uh, Shunzi. Shunzi is uh, another philosopher, and he says, actually, people are innately bad, and you have to punish them. You have to beat them, and they will become good. You have to use punishments and things like that. That philosophy, when Confucianism becomes a kind of thing that's adopted by the Chinese state as the organizing ideology. In America, we would talk about freedom and and that sort of thing. In France, Rob, I think y'all would talk about liberty and, uh, uh, you know, fraternity and whatever else. Egalité. Mm -hmm. Egalité. You know, those ideas are ideologies. A similar kind of thing happens in Han Dynasty China. So we're talking roughly from the year 200 BCE to 220 of the Common Era. In that period, Confucianism is turned into a state ideology. Hamudi, as I mentioned before, does that. So we're talking like 140 BCE, and he uh, he adopts Mencius's line, that people are essentially good, and it's their environment that makes them bad. Right, exactly. This And that's a really good point about there being an alternate strand within Confucianism itself, because whenever you talk about an ism, there's a temptation to think it's this sort of unified ideology all the way through. I mean, when people talk about science today, it sort of sounds that way. Science says, or scientists say, and there's so many differing and disagreeing voices within just that one word. I'm just going to use the word Confucianism because it's handy. But we have noted that it is problematic. It's problematic. Well, it's problematic. But anyway, we'll, we'll, let's just think of it as an umbrella term. 
but there are a lot of different voices within it. And if we were to do a longer series on Confucius, that would be, or on Confucianism maybe, or whatever we're going to call it, that might be a, a more interesting way to do it, is to have this sort of call and response. So Menchus says this, Shinza says this. Later on, you have the extremely famous scholar Zhu Xi, who you could make a case for being the most influential scholar, I don't know if ever in China, but certainly he's right up there. Very much responsible for the Confucian classics being the core learning in the Chinese educational system for centuries. Anyway, Zhu Xi is is uh, has been called kind of the father of of Neo Confucianism, the sort of reassertion of Confucianism in the Song Dynasty. So that's nine sixty to twelve seventy nine, something like that. Right, and, and he just like very very important figure in terms of interpreting Confucius. Yeah. When you think of Confucianism, oftentimes what you're thinking of is Zhu Xi's interpretation of Confucianism, <laughs> right? Right, right. I, sh- I should I should uh, point out that at the close of this passage, Mencius, in in good uh, Chinese disciple fashion, refers back to the master. Right? He quotes Confucius and the Book of Odes, or what's sometimes called the Classic of Poetry, the Shi Jing. He has a quote from them both. The Shi Jing says, "Heaven produces the teeming multitude." As there are things, there are their specific principles. When the people keep their normal nature, they will love excellent virtue. And then the Confucius quote says, The writer of this poem indeed knew the way. This is Confucius referring to the, the part from the Shi Jing. Therefore, as there are things, there must be their specific principles. And since people keep to their normal nature, therefore they love excellent virtue. Now, Lee, you and I have grown up in an era when... I'm, I'm, I feel pretty safe in saying the orthodox view of anything to do with government or politics or statecraft in general is pessimism, if not outright cynicism, right? Like, oh, right, people are really good. All you have to do is leave them to their virtue and they'll just totally take care of things. Right. That's a great idea. But there was a point when this was an open debate. I mean, if, if, if I came on TV right now running for office and said this. I'm pretty sure a lot of people would start to laugh. But when Mencius was speaking, this was fairly revolutionary. I don't I don't know about your your reading of of contemporary politics, Rob. I I think there are people who are saying similar things. Um, But I I definitely agree with you that uh, it was revolutionary at at the time that Mencius said it. It is also revolutionary because it does become or Confucian does become sort of the state ideology by the Han dynasty. We can have a lot of fun podcasts talking about how that worked out. We kind but, of already did, Rob, right? Remember we did that podcast on the San Jing, and the, the very first two lines of the San Jing are uh, 人之初,性本善, right? Like, in the beginning, in people's beginning, their nature was originally good. So that's the the Senza Jing is the three character classic. Um, we did a podcast on it. I'll put it in on on the show notes when I put it uh, put the podcast up on the website. Check the website. Um, the Senza Jing is just kind of like my first Confucian primer. It's like the Fisher Price version of of Confucianism, <laughs> right, Rob? I it's love just, it. Yeah, it's, it's uh, Fisher Price Confucius. Fantastic. <laughs> it's just it's just kind of like Orthodox Confucianism boiled down into something that a child could learn. These were kind of like the the first thing that a kid training to become a Confucian scholar would learn. They they would read this this book, the three character classic, and memorize it. And it, it's very easy to memorize because it's just kind of got this snappy rhythm that uh that's great. Um and, and so we see the long arm of con- of of Confucianism and really of Mencius's take of Confucianism coming down to to late imperial times when when the three character classic is made. You, you know the, the your reference to the sons of the Jing is interesting because that is one of the reasons why Confucianism takes hold the way it does and lasts for as long as it does. I mean it's you know we talked about Zhu Xi earlier, but as of the Song Dynasty, when Neo Confucianism starts back up, when it starts back up, starts up, Confucianism is the thing you have to learn if you want to become a state official. You have to not just learn it, but be able to have interesting interpretations of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's it's 
partly because of this almost obsession with this one ideology that modern Chinese reformers and writers in the early 20th centuries, Lu Xun in particular, just really couldn't stand Confucianism anymore. Because if the way it's propounded is just memorizing rhymes and endlessly repeating it in exams, it's it's awfully hard to develop anything new. It, it became stale, right? It becomes stale. And it makes me wonder if one of the reasons why I think like a lot of Taoist writing that I read, Zhuangzi, Laozi, and some of the ones that followed, one of the reasons that still feels revolutionary is because it didn't ever get accepted as state ideology. It it, it sort of had to thrive in the underground and on the fringes, whereas this other thing became so much a part of life that h- how do you how do you totally change something that's as natural as a fish in water, you know? Just to correct you, Rob, I think it did briefly become state ideology in some of the, the small evanescent states that that popped up between the Han and the the Sui dynasty. But your your point I think is still stands. It didn't kind of get baked into state ideologies for long enough for it to get stale and kind of crusty like Confucianism did. Makes me wonder sometimes if 800 years from now, someone's going to be writing about some aspect of our political thought today. You're in America, but I'll say we anyway. I'm in France, but I'll say we anyway. Don't y'all say we in France? Sorry, in we. That- we, we do, but I'm, I'm thinking more of we being Amer- like we as Americans. Because I'm American. I'm no, sort no, no, sorry, sorry, still that was, thinking about that was a joke. About- oh, we yes, we we. What we, a great we. joke, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was that was right on point, man. The Doctor, joke about the French Doctor Lee Moore. Woo, Doctor Lee Moore with his linguistic mastery. The we the puns yes, never Lee. end. <laughs> They never end. I wish they would, but they they never do. No, they never do. But I do wonder, you know, because reading this now, it's hard to read. It's very hard to read Confucius with any kind of fresh eyes at all. I mean, you and I didn't grow up in China, but even then, when I pick up Confucius, I kind of go, ugh. We carry that baggage of of this long tradition of how Confucius has been interpreted by Mencius and Zhu Xi and thousands of other scholars. We carry that with us, right? It's in our brain. We yes. can't, we can't sh- sh- you know, throw it aside, really. You no, you can't. And so it's extremely hard reading stuff like this in any kind of fresh way. I will say this, though, in closing. What, what I do kind of like about going to Mencius once in a while is it is a very positive outlook on life. It's kind of fun once in a while to read a Okay, it's an open question whether Munches was a philosopher or not, but let's just call him one in, in, for the sake of, of simplicity. It's it's rare to find a philosopher who's super positive about people and things. Like, you know what? People are capable of great things. We should just really make it possible for them to go do great and good things. Rob, I think that's a great place to end it. Thinking about each of us going out and doing great and good things, you know, whatever you think of, of Munches... Uh, he he kind of set the path of how Confucius was supposed to be interpreted. His his thinking that human nature is innately good, and it's only kind of the en- environment, a bad environment that makes it evil. Something that I, this passage highlights becomes the dominant way of thinking about human nature for the next two thousand years. Uh, so incredibly yep. important passage. Thank you for selecting it. Uh, any final thoughts, Ron? Nope, that's all I got. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.